please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Welcome to the CNBC TV 18 special. I'm Shireen Bhan and we're counting down to the union budget on the 1st of February. The economic survey under Arvind Subramaniam has come to become a repository of data and some good ideas. Joining us now to engage in a conversation on his 300-page economic survey for this year is the Chief Economic Advisor. Appreciate you joining us here. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, uh, under you, the economic survey really has become a repository of meaningful data and some insights. But let me get the bread and butter stuff out of the way. Let's start by talking about interest rates because you very publicly advocated for lower interest rates you've pitched that to the Reserve Bank publicly several times over but now you believe that the cycle has turned what does that mean are we going to see an extended pause or is the possibility of even a rate hike now more eminent see I, I think that um, I, I will go so far as to say that relative to the last 18 months when we consistently undershot our inflation target now we are at or close to that uh, so so clearly the case for easing mm. is now less persuasive uh, but now you know on current policy we seem to be close to the inflation target so mm. uh, you know I, I would think that we're about right here so do you admit that you got the forecast especially when it comes to oil wrong because you had forecast a durable reduction in crude oil prices and we're currently at almost 70 and most influential market watchers do seem to suggest that 60 could in fact be the floor as far as crude is concerned so in that environment then what is the flexibility that the reserve bank has no i, I think that see firstly um, um, i will admit uh, completely that um, I had certainly thought that it would be very difficult for oil to go beyond and stay beyond 5560. It's it surprised me. It surprised many market participants. Um, but I think there are some uh, uh, explanatory factors. But I think going forward, what it means for policy is very simple. That you know whatever you expect the new level of prices to be, uh, medium term, 60, whatever, 65. I don't know what the new floor is. Uh, yesterday, for example, the rig count went up mm. on shale. So there's still. I'm not ruling out the possibility that you know it could come down again. Let's wait and see. It, a lot is going to depend upon the Saudi Aramco uh, listing. The well. Aramco yeah. oil listing. Uh, but if prices remain whatever 60, 65. Mm. A monetary policy will have to take that into account and you know they have an inflation target they have to meet that you haven't given an inflation forecast in this survey let me end mm. then by asking you one last question on interest rates the possibility of a rate hike I mean uh, we'll have to see I think so far we're close to inflation target let's see what happens uh, and um, uh, so I think that you know we're there or thereabouts. So I don't know whether, depending on how circumstances evolve, we'll have to we'll have to see. Okay, let me talk to you then about fiscal consolidation because you have made the pitch uh, for not being overly ambitious as far as fiscal consolidation targets are concerned to ensure that credibility is retained, given the fact that we're in an election year. But why make the case for fiscal slippage, given the fact that you believe that on whether it's direct taxes, personal income tax at a historic high of 2.3 which is what the survey points out or even GST which you know your the survey highlights is looking much more robust than was estimated or anticipated given the fact that you see growth improving then why build the case for fiscal slippage see I think uh, uh, I think uh, maybe just factually to correct things uh, if you read the, the fiscal slippage that I said was for this year for yeah. 17 18 yeah. right and there uh, 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 remember that the secretary has uh, said clearly and publicly what the market borrowing for this year is going to be mm -hmm. and you know markets have taken that into account and that's going to be the fiscal outcome for this year uh, that may involve a bit of slippage may not we'll have to see mm. but that's for this year for next year what I've said three things very yeah. clear one the fact that it's an election year does not mean fiscal populism mm. and I think everyone is on board no fiscal populism second point made very clearly is that if you look at the pure economic cycle mm. now you would in principle and I would argue for an ambitious fiscal consolidation mm. on economic grounds mm. because inflation is higher output is uh, you know higher output gaps are closing mm. it, there's more volatility and external uncertainty therefore uh, you know consolidation but uh, between saying that you should not have populism uh, and saying you must completely ignore 
political reality. Mm. I think there's a middle ground saying, yes, we must have fiscal consolidation, but it may have to, to some extent, take account of, of you know, where we are in, in, the, in the calendar. Mm. And what that means is that, yes, consolidation, but how much is the question? Okay. So if you're saying that we need to, we need to root ourselves in political reality, we are in an election year, but that doesn't necessarily mean fiscal populism, then what does it mean exactly? It means, you know, um, see, remember, I have always argued uh, for, even on the FRBM committee, that steady, you know, this government believes in fiscal consolidation for its own sake, not mm. because of ratings agencies and so on. And what India's fiscal policy, I think, demands is steady reductions, steady reductions in both the debt and the deficit. Mm. So that would be what I think uh, government should aim for. 3% uh, is what the target is for next year, for FI19. Who's, um, according to whom? Well, that is according to the budget last year. So oh, for yeah, FI19, yeah, yeah. it's 3%. Yeah, yeah. Do you believe that uh, we are going to be able to stick with that? Or do you believe that 3.2, which is what the markets are factoring in at this point in time, would be the modest, <coughs> credible fiscal consolidation plan that you're See, talking I, about? I think, first of all, you'll find out in, in, in a couple of days. Uh, and also depends upon where we're starting now. So let's see how we turn out. Uh, the suspense will have to hold for next 36 hours. Now. Okay, let me then talk to you about uh, uh, investments as well as exports, because I think these are the two themes that you talk about or spend a lot of time in the survey talking about them. And you believe that both of them are below takeoff speed at this point in time. Uh, what is it going to take to boost investments? Recapitalization, uh, yes. Uh, what happens as far as the NCLT process is concerned is another uh, uncertainty that we need to deal with. But outside of that, is there need for fiscal intervention to boost investments? See, um, <clears throat> one oh, a very strong message I have is for this year, for the coming year, is that there is already a full policy agenda that requires completing a lot of things that government has already done mm. and that you don't need anything big and new and radical okay. you know, All right. I, and I, I, I'm not saying this as a, as a kind of defense of anything I think you know if we can support agriculture mm. if we can because remember resolution and recapitalize has just begun yeah we have to finish that yeah. if we privatize Air India right stabilize the GST which mm. is you know still uh, a few things uh, uh, kinks need to be ironed out and if we head off macro pressures mm. I think that's a very ambitious agenda you don't need to do a whole lot extra to to you know to get to the growth forecast that we have in the survey but do you feel confident uh, where we are and you know whether it's the the state bank chief or it's the private sector banks most people are assuming that the first list of the NCLT hopefully should see some kind of conclusion by the the first half of this year so maybe March April that's the timeline that they're working with will that will that provide the much needed investment support yeah. because you know you're still saying that uh, private capex continues to be modest yeah see I think that the advantage of early resolution of the first 12 is twofold one actually threefold one is that these companies will become cleaner balance sheet will be cleaner and they will be able to spend more mm. one second I think it will establish the credibility of the resolution process itself and the subsequent cases can also be done quickly and third above all it will signal that you know we've kind of put the twin balance sheet problem mm. really behind us and that could boost investor sentiment as well so I think early resolution and quick resolution and resolution consistent with what the process throws up, you know, no second round, third round, mm. you know, clean, quick, I think it can have a big impact on, on the investment cycle. Let me ask you about exports because that you believe is going to be the, the, the second engine to really drive the kind of growth rates that we need. Uh, you talk about the decoupling that uh, you know, we've seen and you hope that now we will start to participate in the global recovery which is getting stronger and more secular and broad based every day. Is there a need for export-led incentives? You ask that question in the context of the textile package that was given. This is an ask of the Commerce Minister. Do you believe that that's the need of the hour today to boost exports? See, I, I think that, first of all, with the world already, the first nine months, we're doing about 11.3% yeah. manufacturing export growth, which is completely healthy and in line with what other Asian countries are doing. Next year, world growth is going to be higher still. So we should, just on these grounds of export external demand mm. expect to see higher export growth whether we need to supplement that with further action sure I, I think that the the clothing package 
I had some important lessons. Mm. I think the government is uh, extending it to some other sectors. Uh, I think uh, you know the other thing that I've, uh, we've highlighted is the exchange rate. Yeah. Uh, I think we have to make sure that that's supportive of the economy as well. Mm. So I think between how much of that is a challenge because you talk about how it's gone up 21 percent in the last three years and that is hurting the uh, export sector. But you know the government says that we have a hands-off approach when it comes to the currency. So what do you do about that? Yeah, I mean th that's for uh, the you know uh, the RBI to decide. But I think all of us can work together to ensure that I think it's not as if the RBI is unaware of, of the impact that it has on competitiveness. So, so I think all policy levers, you know, depending on who's manipulating which lever, have, has, have to come into play to support exports. But the point is that there is a base of healthy demand, which wasn't the case, you know, a year ago or a couple of years ago, uh, to build on. And I think there is a case uh, we should be, uh, you know, uh, galvanizing and harnessing that uh, demand momentum. Let me talk to you about agriculture because that clearly uh, shows up as, as a challenge that we need to deal with. And, you know, yesterday, if you heard the president's speech, you would think that all was great and well and on the agriculture front, but that's not the case. And the survey highlights whether it's the decline in GVA, it's the deceleration in rural wages, it's the low sowing as far as Rabi and Kharif are concerned. I mean, uh, you know, there is a lot there that should worry us. Will mere uh, hike in allocations towards some of these schemes like the NREGS, etc., alleviate the problem? Uh, record production doesn't seem to have helped the agriculture situation. How worried are you about the agriculture sector today? Look, I, I think agriculture is, uh, you know, is something that concerns everyone in government. Um, I think you should think of it in two ways. One, how do you protect farmer against the downside and how do you push up the upside? Da you know, on the downside, we've had the Fasil Bima Yojana, but also we have price stabilization and Madhya Pradesh has this interesting experiment mm. on price deficiency. I think that's something that we should be looking at more carefully to see whether it's replicable in other areas for other crops. Mm. But on the upside, it's a medium term challenge. I mean, how do you boost agricultural productivity growth? Um, and, and has, that there, has there, you know, has there been an underappreciation of the of the crisis that the agriculture sector has been faced with? Because I, you know, this is not a one-year phenomena. We've seen this now over the last three years, and two of them were not drought years. I think the first two years were drought years. Yeah. Uh, the third year, I think we were a little bit surprised that despite record output, prices came down so much. That was, you know, the last season. Uh, and that's something that, you know, it's kind of a relatively a, a new problem. And I think the government responded by, in the case of pulses, for example, mm. increasing procurement and then liberalizing some policy. So I think we've learned our lessons from that. And this uh, agricultural year going forward, I think that a combination of budgetary support, policy reform, and then really planning for the medium term. Uh, before I move to the next issue, just uh, on the issue of agriculture, because the survey highlights the need for a reorientation of policy. Uh, what would the priorities be? You know, I, I could uh, list a long, uh, put out a long list, but certainly consistent with the with the survey, the, the research we've done. I think I find it for me it was a surprise that 70 years after independence, only 46% of India is irrigated, mm. right? Agriculture is irrigated. So I think we need to expand irrigation, but against the backdrop of water scarcity. It's not that you can just. Um, so that's one irrigation. We know, you know, the power subsidy is, you know, also contributes to this problem. So, in some ways, I think one should think about India as two agricultures. Mm the cereal agriculture and the non-cereal agriculture. I think in the cereal agriculture, the problem really is, or the challenge is, how do you, because cereal agriculture gets a lot of policy support, subsidies, fertilizer, yeah. power, yeah. MSP, etc. The trick there is to convert all these distortionary forms of support mm. into more something like a UBI for yeah. agriculture. I think that's one. In the other areas, I think we need to focus a lot more targeting post-harvest, um, you know, uh, creating one market. I mean, that's the problem yeah. in, 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 pulse, in uh, 
of onions and potatoes, for example. Let me now talk about the other highlight that the survey throws up, and that is the tax-to-GDP ratio. And you, you talk about how India has been stuck in this tax-to-GDP inertia now for several years, despite the fact that we've grown at an average of about 6.5%. Do you believe, in light of what we've seen with the GST or even demonetization, are we on the cusp of breaking that inertia? Uh, I, think, I think there is reason to hope that, actually, because indirect taxes, 50% increase in taxpayers. Uh, individual income tax filers, big increase after November 16. But is that 16. sustainable is the question? Well, just to give you one example, we did this individual income tax filer calculation six months ago and, and, and now. Yeah. Big, big increase. So it seems to be steadily increasing. Uh, and so I think on the individual income taxes in 2017-18, also we've collected more. That's also gone mm. up. Uh, so I think one can be hopeful that going forward that these reforms and this progress can continue. Mm. But, you know, on, on the personal income tax, which uh, the survey says it is at 2.3 percent, up from 2 percent previously, uh, uh, you know, the revenue implications, because a lot of these are still below the threshold, the income tax threshold of 2.5 lakhs. So what are the revenue implications that you foresee going forward? See, I think a lot of new filers have come in. Uh, it's true that for many of them, the reported income is around the threshold. But I believe that once they're in the tax net, over time, with inflation and nominal mm. GDP growth, they will all progressively become part of the tax debt. I want to ask you two quick questions. One, uh, you talk about the need for a more carrot and less stick approach uh, in the budget in the context of what we've seen with spectrum auctions and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, demonetization, it was, it was a heavy stick, right? Uh, you, I heard you call it a structural action, not so much a structural reform anymore. I don't know. I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. But how do you how do you read demonetization today? Was it worth the pain? You know, normally when I'm asked this question now, I say it's so yesterday. The, uh, the, why are we talking about well, demonetization? You spent a lot of time talking about it in the survey. Yeah, because I think in, in, we spoke about it in the survey to understand the decoupling that took mm. place. Uh, specifically the impact of that and also Which GST. is why I'm asking, was it worth the pain? Uh, that is a question that, uh, you know, uh, as uh, uh, Chawan Lai said, only time will tell, you know. We'll have to wait and see. There were, no doubt there were costs, but there are also some gains. And, you know, it's an assessment that has to be done on an ongoing basis. But I think, you know, both in terms of the informal sector, in terms of exports, also GST, there were transitional costs. I think no one can deny that. But let's see what, on the other side of the ledger, what the benefits are going to be. On the GST, I mean, you have reiterated the call uh, for a single rate with a revenue neutral rate of about 15 to 16 percent. I mean, uh, the, 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 uh, the mood... Uh, is unlikely to, to go forward with a single rate of tax, e even in the near future, maybe three to, to five years. But do you believe that the inclusion of things that are so far excluded from the GST, that's a much more realistic expectation to have? I think b both are on the agenda. I think, um, you know, uh, electricity, petroleum, real estate, I mean, are on the agenda, will be on the agenda. But that doesn't preclude us from considering also uh, simplifying the rate structure. Is, is, does that, has that gained any currency? Because, you know, the finance minister continues to maintain that in a country like India, you can't have a BMW and milk, for instance, being priced at See, the but, tax but, at the same but, rate. But the, look at the evidence so far, right, that the 28% rate, which we all agreed was too much, We've made big, uh, you know, uh, 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 progress on that. The 28% rate has now shrunk. So I think there is scope for, uh, you know, improving the rate structure. And the, the GST has been in operation for less than six months. I mean, let's, you know, and I think what has been, I think, creditable about the system yeah. is not just that we've done it, but that we've been able to respond to whatever glitches and challenges that have emerged. And that's how a system should be. Let me end then by asking you about the pink cover. And uh, I, I heard you say that you got a lot of social media flack uh, uh, for it. I, I think it's unfair because I think it is time for us to actually mainstream this conversation. Uh, but I can in understand the sentiment because of the current environment. You said that there is a need to awaken our, our, our conscience as a nation uh, around these issues. What bothers you the most about this? Today? See, I think there are many, many things that I think we made progress on a lot of uh, indicators. But I, uh, maybe at the heart of it is that Indian society, you know, values boys over girls. And that's maybe the heart of the problem. And that's what we try and highlight in the survey.
Is there a policy answer to being able to correct that? I, I think it goes back at least three, four thousand years, and I think so. I, I'm not sure what one policy lever I can find to change three thousand years of history. Irin Subramaniam, always a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you very much for joining us here on CNBC TV 18. Appreciate your time. That's the Chief Economic Advisor with his uh, insights on the economic survey. For now, from all of us here, goodbye and many thanks for watching.